Thank you. Thank you so much. So good evening, everyone. My name is Ray Jeffers, and I'm the director of the Form of Color Network here at RAFI USA. Also joining with us tonight from the RAFI team is our policy director, uh, Margaret Crone Lukens, and Carolina, our former outreach manager, who will be helping us with tech tonight and keep an eye on the chat for your questions. Hey, Ray, sorry to interrupt. Before we get started, would you give uh, my other profile here that says Margaret Spanish recording um, permission to record? Oh, I can do it. Sorry for the interruption, y'all. <laughs> Carry on. No problem. Thank you. So we want to welcome you all tonight to one of the many trainings we are planning to offer throughout this year uh, around advocacy and support for our farmers that we serve. Uh, so tonight we will go over a brief introduction to how to lobby and hope you will gain a better understanding um, of how to advocate for yourself and the farmers you may serve for the organizations that are joining us tonight. We will be discussing today primarily lobbying at the federal level. However, much of what we will cover would assist you in lobbying uh, at the state and the local level as well. Next slide. So a few webinar housekeeping. Uh, we will let you know, as you just saw, that this will be recorded and shared with all attendees afterwards. And generally, we sometimes post these on our, uh, our YouTube page, uh, so you can go back and, and look at them. Also, I um, want you to introduce yourself in the chat, kind of give your name, where you're from, your farm name, and if you're a producer, what you produce. And uh, as you think of questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat, because we'll be kind of keeping tabs on those and then bring those, uh, coming back to those at the appropriate time. Next slide. So who are we? Rural Advancement Foundation International USA. We were founded in 1990 uh, to challenge the deep inequities in our food system. Um, we do that uh, with, in RAFI USA, as we'll be referred to rest throughout this uh, presentation. We do that through many programs, challenging corporate power, where we believe in building a better food system through equity and accountability, uh, holding corporations and governmental, government accountable to curb the adverse effects of livestock concentration, our Come to the Table program, where we house our farm and faith partnership project, where we connect uh, North Carolina faith communities with farmers uh, from RAFI USA's Farm of Color Network to create sustainable food-based partnerships. Our expanding market access program, it supports farmers markets and other local food marketplaces that want to see all community members welcome and regular shoppers at the market. Uh, it also uh, helps support food access that covers anything from targeted EBT incentive programming to broader capacity building for market managers. Our farm advocacy program. Uh, we have farm advocates that provide expertise and guidance to save or strengthen farms from working with lenders to dealing with disasters. Our work, uh, their work is tailored to meet the individual needs of each farmer. Uh, of course, our policy, which is uh, what we'll be talking about tonight. Policy, you know, shapes the environment in which farms thrive or fail and determines the rules we play by. Policy shapes the structure of industries. Policy directs where and how we spend our tax dollars. Policy can build a system that continues to concentrate wealth and power with fewer and fewer people, or it can strive to make systems fair for individual farmers and communities. Our Just Foods program, it continues to work uh, towards a world where all who labor in agriculture are respected, protected, valued, and have the power to earn a dependable income and where air, water, soil, and culture are preserved and protected for future generations. Today, we primarily do this through direct service and technical assistance with a commitment to overserved communities that have historically been underserved. And then finally, our form of color network is what I lead as a director. Uh, we founded this network in 2017 to support farmers and grow their numbers. The network provides farmer-led technical assistance and funding opportunities and hosts farm tours, networking events, and gatherings to highlight ancestral traditions and knowledge, as well as explore market solutions. Currently, the program serves farmers of color in the Southeast, the U.S. Lower and Mid-Atlantic, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Our mission here at RAFI, challenging the root causes of unjust food systems, supporting, supporting and advocating for economically, racially, and ecologically just farm communities. And our vision, we envision a thriving, sustainable, an equitable food system where farmers and farm workers have dignity and agency, where they are supported by just agriculture policies, where corporations and institutions are accountable to their communities. Next slide. So tonight we're gonna to talk about lobbying your legislators. And we want you to know you do not have to be an expert on policy. The more you and, you and 
more you are an invested member of your community and speak up about what you want your elected officials, the stronger our democracy will be. So you don't have to be an expert and we want you to remember that relationships matter. Next slide. Tonight, we're gonna to cover uh, a little bit of general tips, scheduling the visit, logistics, preparing the actual meeting, and uh, did you hit your goal? And we're gonna get a little farm bill update from our policy director, Margaret. So how do you lobby? How, did, how to do a lobby visit, general tips. Get there early. You're already gonna have a very limited time to probably speak to your policymaker or your member of Congress. And so getting there early sometime, um, we've had instances where the member gets there early. So that may give you a few more minutes than your allotted time. So you know, we recommend you definitely get in there early. Practice your story and your ask beforehand. Rehearse with your group if there's a group. Kind of play play off of each other. Someone plays the member, so you can kind of think of questions and things that that the member may ask, uh, and that way you kind of prepare. And avoid tangents. We all have that one person, especially if we're in a group, that sometimes wants to start here but end somewhere off subject. So we want to make sure that we definitely stay on task, and we know we can be passionate about these issues, but we don't want to go off on a tangent to kind of turn the member off, right? Uh, next, we want to make sure that uh, you, your ask is something that that election official can actually do. So, you know, we know we have policymakers at the local, state, and federal level. So we really want to do our research to make sure that our issue, that we're talking to the right policymaker, that we don't want to go talk to a federal policymaker about something that's state controlled or even locally controlled. And then research a member of Congress ahead of time. Get a sense of their record and their messaging that will resonate with, uh, you know, how you can resonate with them the best. So, you know, we recommend go to their campaign website, see what they campaigned on, see what you may align with uh, before you go into that member, just so you kind of know them a little bit better uh, when you're getting ready to advocate to them. Next slide. Uh, also, we don't want you to be nervous. Be yourself. Just go in there and be yourself. Don't worry about um, who they may perceive you to be. Speak confidently and naturally. Be considerate of your members' time and constraints. Again, we talked about showing up early. But we also want to know if we have a 15, 30, or a hope if you get a 45-minute meeting, you're lucky. But if you get, you know, we want to be respectful of their time uh, since they were able to get you in that day. Also, be courteous and concise in presenting your points and your request. Again, you have a, a limited amount of time, so you kind of really want to go ahead and get down to business. Uh, and then uh, early Congress is a poor timing for a lobby meeting. So what we mean by that is when they're just first getting to D.C., especially after an election, many of them don't even have committee assignments yet. They're trying to get their offices straight and their staff uh, hired and aligned. So uh, we don't recommend, you know, getting in touch with them too early. Try to get them, let them get settled in first before you start making those, those visits. Next slide. So scheduling. The best way to schedule, and what I like to do is I like to call the member's office and ask who is the scheduler and then get their phone number and their email. And then uh, if I can talk with them that day, I would like to get, you know, get on the schedule. If not, we follow up with an email. That way you have a record of that as well. And then some offices, though, they uh, prefer requests maybe uh, in writing or they may have a form on their website. If you go that route, we suggest in a few days to really follow up on that request to make sure that it was received or that someone saw it and that you actually are, are on the schedule. And if not, give them another few days, call them back or email someone. Persistence is key here. Uh, logistics. Um, you don't have to dress like a DC lobbyist. I know you, if you visited the Hill before, you see folks walking around in their fancy suits and pretty shoes, but you're an advocate for your community. You're hopefully from that person's district. If not, you're advocating for folks in that person's district. Farm business attire is fine. Just be neat and presentable. Make sure you wear comfortable shoes. If you've ever been in the halls of Congress, those are some long halls, lots of walking. Um, security, we suggest bring just what you need so you can go ahead and get through security quickly. Uh, and a lot of times a folder with your materials is helpful. Uh, allow at least 45 minutes if you're planning on visiting uh, uh, members in the House or the Senate or you have to go between buildings. Um, also, if you uh, have time in between there, don't worry about exiting and have to come back through security. They have cafeterias uh, there in both the House and the Senate buildings. Uh, we wanted to make sure here that uh, we let you know uh, also about the Office of Accessibility Services. So if you 
need maybe a wheelchair, they have those that they can loan to, loan to you or if you need interpreting services uh, um, for those that may need it. But we want you to know that you have to request those through the member's office. So you know, if you, if you only go through the office of accessibility, those are for folks who are just like doing tours. But if you are needed because you're going to meet with a member, please contact their office and then they can assist you uh, with either meeting you at the door, letting you know the, uh, the, the interests that are more accessible for folks based off their needs. Uh, so just contact that member's office and, and let them know what you need there and they'll, they'll be able to assist you. So Margaret, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you real quick to talk a little bit about the survey we wanna do midway. Okay, um, and I'll just add on the accessibility part that if the office knows ahead of time um, that uh, you have someone who uses a wheelchair, um, and I would say in particular, if you are like scheduling a day where you have multiple meetings and you might be going back and forth across the hill, um, you could ask that staffer if they could walk you through the tunnel so that you don't have to deal with like exiting the building um, and crossing the entire hill outside uh, with a wheelchair. Um, so I think just like asking up front and like there are, I think they're pretty good at um, accommodating. So um, encourage folks to do that. Um, and yes, yeah, so uh, a little interlude here. Uh, this is one of a number of trainings that we're doing. Um, and some of the trainings that we're planning on doing in the future are sort of topic specific deeper dives into the farm bill. And uh, but in order to plan the trainings that are going to be the most useful for y'all, uh, we'd love to know which topics are most important to you. So um, we have a link in the chat, which is a very quick, I think it's two questions, maybe three, including your email address, um, to let us know what topics you're most interested in um, having us do sort of a deep dive on to just familiarize yourself with how those topics show up in the Farm Bill. Um, so thanks in advance for filling that out. Thank you, Margaret. Next slide, Carolina. So preparing for the meeting. Uh, again, most meetings, 15, 30, lucky if you get a 45 minute meeting, but uh, we would say probably average you get a 30 minute meeting. Uh, and if you don't get to meet with the member, you may be meeting with a staffer or an LA a legislative assistant. Uh, Legislative assistants, they're very busy people too. They have extensive portfolios to cover beyond uh, agriculture. Um, they're, don't be shocked, they're often on the younger side. Uh, their degree of knowledge about the topic you may be talking about will vary widely. So be ready to be able to offer that introduction or that education about the, the subject you're speaking about. And uh, they may not necessarily be familiar with your district or from your district. So again, just kind of be ready there to kind of to give them uh, a little intro about what you're talking about or to kind of set the scene, so to speak, about the issues that you may be working and how they may affect that member's district back home. Next slide. Uh, at the meeting. We suggest get settled in, start a little bit of small talk about the district, especially if you may know the member. If you're not, you've already done your research. So you may know some of the members' interests, or you may know an area where they grew up in in the district that you may be familiar with, or a place that they may frequent often uh, that you just kind of can share that back home story. Um, you know, but be mindful of your of your your size of your group, because again, you don't want to take up a lot of time uh, when you don't have a lot. Uh, with every member of your group, especially if you have a large group kind of going around doing this, doing the same thing. So if you have a group, talk amongst yourselves before you go in there, see who may have the most connection or better connection or family connection, some type of relationship with your member, and maybe maybe pick them to kind of be that spokesperson uh, to make that small talk or assign them the small talk bar while you assign the other areas that you're going to talk about that day to the rest of your group. So make sure you introduce everyone there and, and, and make sure you thank them for their time. Um, especially uh, if you're dealing with the LA, um, because again, they are running and sometimes you just get a little corner in the office just to sit down and meet with them sometimes. So uh, be thankful for that. Again, pick a group lead based off of your expertise. If you if you have a group, someone may know more about this subject or that subject uh, and just kind of align that before you go in and that way you kind of can turn it over again, being effective with your time. There may be a marker bill uh, that you can ask them to support, for, that you can ask them support for, or you may, um, ask just 
your ask may be just more general about support for agriculture and small farm, uh, BIPOC farmers and so on. Um, group participants, make sure each of you tell a story about um, why the ask is important to you because, hey, you took your time that day to be there in that office to meet with that member. So we know there's something uh, that, that drove you to do that, right? So make sure you share that uh, with the member. And uh, if you have a mix of constituents and non-constituents, make sure those that are from that member's district, please make sure they have time to talk and to share that they're from that district as well. Next slide. So in the conversation, focus exclusively on how the issues you are addressing affect your congressional district, that congressional district. And explain how your issues will impact specific population groups, businesses or the economy for your community. Again, you're from that community, you're from that district, um, and so make sure you share that and what you feel the impacts, rather than be positive or negative. Uh, no matter how passionate you feel about that issue, do not rant and rave. Um, no, don't diminish um, your credibility by having that in the face type of demeanor, pointing or, you know, again, we know we're here and we'll be there lobbying because we're passionate about our issue, but just make sure we kind of control those passions and really uh, work to get our point across where we're not perceived to be angry or, um, or again, having that kind of in your face demeanor. And hey, sometimes your legislator won't agree with you. It's okay. Um, just reiterate your point. Uh, make sure we'll talk about it a little bit later about knowing the issue and being able to answer questions and also knowing the other side of the issue. So if they're on the other side of that issue, you can ask questions, see why they or have them to clarify why they believe that. And then again, um, stay civil. <laughs> When you're when, when you're disagreeing, and always try to end that conversation on a positive note. Uh, demonstrate the connection between what you are requesting and the interest of the member's constituency. Again, show that impact in that member's district, um, and then also um, talk about the opposition, what the opposition might be saying. Those are the type. That's that type of homework we want to do before we go into the meeting. We want to know, hey, if we're on this side, what are the folks on the other side saying and how can we negate what they're saying or answer the hard questions if we were asked about uh, their side of the story. Uh, explain your position with facts, but also use those personal stories to kind of try to tie those in. And again, make the connection between your request and potential benefits to the constituents and let the member understand the personal ramifications or benefits resulting from their actions or their decision. Next slide. Um, so we also want to think about what could we ask. You can ask uh, if you don't if they if you have something that you don't understand, ask them to explain it. Just like we're there to educate them, they may know something that we're not privy of, and uh, or if they say something that we don't know about, ask the LA or the member to kind of clarify that. Um, ask them to clarify their position, especially if they're for you know they're against uh, the position that we're in there advocating for that day. Um, take time to have some specific actions, uh, have some specific actions, such as sponsoring a bill or voting for or against a pending measure. Or uh, we talked a little earlier about there may be some market bills out there that we may want that member to support. Kind of know those going in. Have those bill numbers. Those are important uh, because if they don't know a bill, there are so many bills been introduced and they don't know one by the title. If you give them that number, at least they can look it up uh, uh, pretty quickly. And um, you know, be prepared to ask those que you know, other questions like if they're interested in working on other issues or another member's bill or their position on another member's bill or the, the position that you're talking about that day. And remember, if you don't know the answer to a question, say so. But, but offer, you know, that you will go out and get that answer and get back with them. And please, if you say you want to follow up, make sure you follow up, especially with the, uh, with the legislative assistants and their staff. Allow time for back and forth. Make sure you get those questions, have time at the end for questions and conversation or discussion. Um, repeat your ask, you know, make sure they know why you're there that day. And if you have time, you can also ask questions. Uh, we kind of went over those a little bit, leave behind something. If you have materials that you're bringing, bring extra because there may be additional staff members. Sometimes we go into meetings and we're meeting with a staff member and the chief of staff may sit in on the meeting as well or we have additional staff members that may have to take the meeting before the person that you're uh, scheduled to meet with before they get there. So that way you can have extras to hand out and to, to give them and all staff that's kind of involved. And make sure you grab their business card. 
Um, so you'll remember who you spoke with. You have that to make sure you know who to follow up with. And, uh, and then please make sure again that you follow up them with an email or a thank you um, for the visit. And if they need any additional information, who can be that point of contact uh, in that area? Next slide. So did you hit your goal? Make sure when you leave that office that day that you are, if you shared your experiences and your priorities, make sure you gave clear, sensible, um, you know, that you gave a clear sense of what you care about the most and what you want them as your representative to do about it and start, make sure you had a good start to that relationship that you can continue it further. And especially with a staff member, um, that's one thing that we, you know, it's great meeting with the member and you get to share that, but it's invaluable to get to know their staff, especially those that have those issue leads uh, that, you're, that you're concerned about. And again, be memorable, respectful, on time, focus and be yourself. So I'm gonna turn it over to Margaret. She's gonna talk a little bit about the current farm bill and the process. Thanks, Ray. Um, also, since I think we're, we're doing pretty well on time here, I might offer a couple of reflections from, we went to DC uh, like three times since the beginning of the year, did a bunch of lobby visits and uh, you know, some were amazing, some were, you know, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, the ones that were amazing, uh, were ones where we were in a group of farmers who all sort of represented a little bit of a different angle, um, uh, but were coming with a, a unified asks that they were all sort of collectively supporting. And we had done, um, some great group prep beforehand. So everybody had had a chance to practice what they were going to say. Sometimes it can be really hard. Um, you know, lobby visits have a really limited amount of time and it can be hard to tell your story that is so important to you that is coming from all of this lived experience uh, briefly. <laughs> um, and so having that practice time, uh, if you're going with a group ahead of time, I think is really helpful. Um, also really helpful to let that office know how many people are coming. Um, I have definitely had a lobby visit like in a stairwell of an office building and we made it work, but a meeting room would have been better. <laughs> Um, and it will, it's just also nice for the staffer to not have to suddenly find a place for eight people. Um, yeah, and I think the more that you can show up and have the office think of you as a constituent who may not explicitly be speaking for many other constituents unless you officially are, um, but someone whose experience really represents a voters experience or a group of voters experience rather than like that one guy <laughs> uh, who just has their own individual axe to grind, you know, um, all of those things I think really help uh, make an impact. I'll also say there's a lot of steps in here that um, help increase the impact of a lobby visit, which it may make sense to lean on um, an organization to help with, like um, Rafi will often lobby with farmers and some of the support we can provide uh, in those circumstances are having that, what we call a leave behind, like a one page description of what you want um, so that the farmers themselves don't have to prep them or um, you know, doing research on that member of Congress's record or um, sharing some of the background of the history of a particular bill, stuff like that. Um, if you're going with an organization, that organization may be able to provide that support um, and you can really focus on your expertise as a farmer uh, who knows what's important to you, so. Um, so, so, uh, this training is happening in the context of it's a farm bill year, and, um, this is going to be a super quick preview. Uh, we have some other trainings, uh, where we've talked about the farm bill. Um, but basically most of our food and ag policy fits in the farm bill. It happens about every five years. Uh, the current one will expire in September, 2023. Um, and wanted to just tell you a little bit about the process uh, because now is a great time to go lobby <laughs> um, and also share a little bit about an updated timeline. Um, the way the farm bill is made is that there are committees in each chamber of Congress, uh, one for the House and one for the Senate um, that are the agriculture committees and the farm bill is basically drafted. Uh, there's a version for each committee. Um, <laughs> And you may have heard Ray use the term marker bill. Uh, a marker bill 
is basically just a, a mini bill that gets introduced with the hopes of it getting into a larger bill, um, larger bills like that are also known as omnibus bills. Um, so the farm bill is an omnibus bill. It means there's a bunch of stuff in it. Um, and so members of Congress will introduce marker bills, not because they think they're going to be passed individually, but because if they build enough support for them, um, then they have a higher chance of being included in the larger farm bill. Um, so each committee will write a, a draft of the farm bill um, that's called the mark. So you might hear the terms used, the house mark or the Senate mark. Um, they will discuss, debate, and amend um, their drafts in committee. That process is called markup. Um, and from committee, it will go to the full floor um, where the bills will be voted on uh, in the House and in the Senate. Uh, if or once, <laughs> you know, those different versions of the Farm Bill get passed in both chambers, um, then that text gets sent to a committee called Conference Committee, which includes leaders um, from the House and Senate, committee chairs, et cetera, who basically negotiate. Uh, I'm not going to say it's like going to be like a 50-50 compromise between those two bills, because a lot of it depends on sort of like political power and who has the upper hand and how negotiations are happening. Um, but they'll negotiate uh, and look for something that is uh, a version that sort of combines or incorporates the two different versions um, that those those respective leaders think that they can get their chambers to pass and that they also think that uh, the president will sign. <laughs> um, and they go back to the chambers where they're voted on. And if those identical bills are then passed by both chambers. The final bill is sent to the White House for signature. Um, and one thing to know about this is that as that process goes on, there are fewer and fewer people who have the ability to influence it. And like the cake gets more and more baked as we go. We're in a period right now where lobbying can really make a huge difference. It doesn't mean we should stop like <laughs> uh, at any point in the process, but now's a great time. Um, and uh, yeah, er, I think earlier earlier is better, but it's important to do it uh, the whole way through. Um, so where are we in this process? Let's go next slide. Um, we just passed a deadline. Uh, there will be sort of many deadlines as we go through here, but uh, example, um, the Senate Ag Committee said, senators, send us all of your marker bills and all of your policy proposals for the Farm Bill by March 31st so that the Senate Ag Committee can start putting together that draft bill. Um, some other things that are happening here in the next couple months. Um, returning from recess on April 17th, the Senate is having some hearings uh, the last half of April, the first part of May, on different topics in the Farm Bill. Um, those are good opportunities to hear sort of like what um, what lines of debate and argument uh, are happening uh, about farm bill issues, hearing what different members of Congress have to say. Um, sometimes Rafi will uh, like submit uh, suggested questions to members of Congress for those hearings uh, to elevate issues that we think are important. Um, but that's definitely a part of the debate process for what gets into the Farm Bill drafts. Um, and there's so much uncertainty around these timelines. Also, like we hear things, we hear new things, the timeline shifts again, uh, but June or July or August, we might get those first drafts out of the Ag Committees, um, after which there will be debate and amendments. Um, and Senator Stabenow, who chairs the Senate Ag Committee, I think recently said that she was hoping that they would have markup done. I think she said either at the end of, she was saying maybe at the end of August recess. I think I put it on the next slide actually. Um, and I did not, but <laughs> we're thinking, late summer, perhaps, uh, markup and floor votes. Um, and I also put on here, August, uh, Congress does a summer recess every August, and it is a great opportunity to um, lobby your members of Congress and district. Logistically, it looks a little bit different doing that from 
going to DC, um, but some advantages of it are like, you could invite someone out to your farm when they're in district, which you can't do in DC. Um, so just noting that that's a good time um, to reach out to offices. Um, perhaps there will be a farm bill on the floor uh, in September. Um, a lot of people have been saying they want to do that. Uh, a lot of people are betting that it won't happen that quickly. Um, the reason to get it done by September is because of that uh, expiration date on the current farm bill. Um, if they don't pass a new one um, or pass an extension, uh, which has definitely been done before, um, some programs, their sort of uh, authorization for funding uh, will expire. So um, that's not a great situation, um, but Congress has definitely extended farm bills before and would not be surprised if we saw that happen. Um, there may be some pretty contentious debates. Well, there are always contentious debates. Uh, expecting more of them. Um, added to that, there's a lot of other big business that Congress has on its plate this year. So we will see. Um, but that's sort of now through September will be very busy time for Farm Bill and a great time to lobby. So we had one comment um, in the group talking about how different it is in Puerto Rico, where they have a secretary that's assigned by the governor that assists. And so as we begin our work, um, or continue our work there in Puerto Rico, as well as U.S. Virgin Islands, we do understand that things are happening a little bit differently there and that you do have a uh, representation, even though that member does not vote um, in Congress. Um, we still feel it's important to advocate to them uh, about those needs. And, uh, and again, as we kind of begin our work there, we're, we're understanding those nuances that are a little bit different in the territories. And uh, so how we can best serve you to uh, help you advocate and serve yourselves as well. So Giovanni, thank you for that, for that comment. And remember, I'll, go right I'll also say that um, when we were in DC recently for the Rally for Resilience, um, we had an awesome delegation from Puerto Rico and from US Virgin Islands. And um, our approach there was to um, try to include uh, members from US Caribbean territories in as many of our other lobby meetings as we can, uh, because uh, because the representatives uh, are not voting members, our belief is that <laughs> every single other member of Congress should have the responsibility of uh, of you know caring about the interests of U.S. territories. Um, whether or not they do is a totally different question, but that was the case we were making. And we were also seeing if there were um, members of Congress who might have uh, folks from US Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico um, in their districts as constituents and sort of um, targeting them as well. Uh, but definitely a, a hearts and minds project um, in terms of that, uh, that representation and those issues. And we're still learning. So um, <clears throat> remember again to put your questions in the chat. And if not, we're going to go to the form that you all filled out. Some of you uh, asked some questions in there. Um, here's one, uh, Margaret. What are resources for new farmers to find connections and consumers to sell their products to? So we want to make sure if you're in our service area that you're aware. Uh, the services that we offer in RAFI through uh, some of the market access programs that I spoke of earlier, especially if you're a form of color, joining our form of color network, uh, we can allow you some assistance there, especially, if, again, if you're in the service area, which is the Southeast, U.S., um, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. But if not, you still contact us and we may know other partner organizations that works that do the similar work that we do in your area that we may could get you in touch with. Anything to add, Margaret? Um, just in terms of staying in touch about policy things with Rafi, um, we do have a policy action network that you can sign up for where we'll let you know when there are bills that are introduced that are um, that Rafi is supporting and that you may also want to support. <laughs> um, so there's the sign up there. Uh, we also have uh, a, a number of resources and it will be a growing number of resources um, on our website about the Farm Bill. 
Um, there's a video about the farm bill itself. Um, our farm bill platform is up there. And um, potentially as soon as this week, we may have a um, marker bill tracker uh, with the marker bills that have been introduced that Rafi is endorsing um, that will be up there as well. Uh, we are challenged to keep up with all of the marker bills that get introduced. So we feel like we can sort of share the load and um, put those up for other folks as well. So we have another question that was submitted through the form, a proven strategy to protect and prioritizing farmland. And so I would say, uh, depending on your area, I know here in North Carolina, we have a, uh, a board or uh, group that, uh, that's through our state government uh, that prioritize, prioritizes uh, farmland preservation. And so if you have something similar, you may can get in contact with them to learn more about what you can do. And then also, Margaret mentioned something earlier about in-district um, visits. And so when you know your members back home and you would like them to come out and visit your farm or visit to an area to see where farmland is maybe disappearing, and that way they can actually see that effect firsthand, um, I think that would be uh, definitely beneficial in, in trying to lean on that member about working towards uh, more farmland preservation. Uh, let's see, do you have to be affiliated with a party? And the answer is that is no, but you do want to know your member that you're going to, 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 um, to meet with. Maybe uh, if they're a member of a party, you have a better idea of how uh, they align certain ideas or uh, values, and that way you're aware of those. And so you kind of can tailor those uh, to, that, to that member that you're meeting with. And we can say from our end, who we advocate quite a bit in lobby, it's always important to talk to both sides. So if you do belong to a party and you don't only talk to your members of your party, make sure you're able to have that conversation with members across the aisle as well. Margaret? Yeah, um, it's not always true, but it is often true that agriculture can be like a surprisingly bipartisan area, depending on the issue. Um, and members may be coming at it from sort of different frameworks. And that's one reason why it's great to sort of research that member, see what kind of language they've used about agriculture issues or just issues in general. Like, do they wanna talk about jobs uh, or are they most passionate about talking about climate change? You know, um, and you can sort of adjust your pitch or uh, the, the reasons that you're highlighting for why it's important um, differently depending on their messaging. Um, Sometimes it's a win to lessen the passion of the opposition about something, right? Like they may not wind up supporting your issue, but they may not be as vocal against it. That's absolutely a win. Absolutely. So another question was how to determine best avenues to advocate and our most efficient approach. And so hopefully we covered a few of those uh, tonight in our, in our presentation, but we also, would just like to add again, make sure you do your homework on that member to kind of know their values. Again, if you check their campaign uh, website, uh, not just their congressional member website to kind of see again where their values align, some of the things they may have pushed for, uh, uh, and that way you kind of can, and, and you don't have to be the constituent of that member. And so I think it goes a long way if you're the constituent, but if you know of another member that really aligns with you or aligns with that idea or what you're trying to push, uh, maybe you can set up a meeting with them to be, see how you can assist them in pushing that issue or advocating to their uh, other members or kind of building that that army of support uh, behind you. I see you're off meet, Margaret. You got something to that? Yeah. Um, just a question about best ways to advocate. I, I usually preface talking about lobby, and we didn't because this was just a very specific training about lobbying. But I always want to say that lobbying is one of many legitimate and effective ways to be an advocate. Um, you know, getting media in your local paper that names your member of Congress um, and is talking about your issue, like they have people looking for that. They will read it. You know, broader communication strategies generally. When we went to Washington for the rally, we lobbied and we marched. Um, so there are so many ways to advocate. Uh, <laughs> if I could tell you what is the most effective, then I would be really rich right now and have solved all the world's problems. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, being part of a group is, you know, there's strength in numbers, um, getting noticed, getting media. Um, 
there, yeah, <laughs> it's a big complicated question. Lobbying is, is one great tool among many. So those are the, all the questions I see that were pre-submitted. Um, again, if you have a few more minutes, if you want to put any more in the in the chat, and we had a few folks that uh, registered kind of late, so I think Carolina's going to look to see if they had any questions. But while we're doing that, we want to bring your attention to the slide that's up now on how to get involved and stay in touch with us here at RAFI. We do have a policy action network. Go back one slide, uh, Carolina. Yeah. So we have that policy action network there with its link uh, to where you can kind of go in and talk about, um, give us a little, do our, our intake form to talk about the issues that support you. I, I didn't mention earlier, all of our work is, uh, RAFI is really farmer driven. And so these policies and things that we come up, that we go and advocate for, these are coming directly from the farmers that we serve. And so we want you to definitely be a part of that. Um, we also have our newsletter for our formal color network that you can use the QR code to sign up for, follow us on social media as well. And, uh, and again, if you're a farmer of color, you're not a member of our, our network, or uh, if you're in the Caribbean and you want to, we have also a Caribbean farmer network, uh, that please go on our website and find those links so you can join in the next slide, or you can contact myself. Uh, and if it's policy related, you can contact Margaret and we have that contact information on the next slide. And I also wanted to mention our farmer hotline uh, for farmers that are in crisis, that you can call that, that number. That is available uh, Monday through Friday until 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern time every night. And so if it's something that we may not get help with, we may know someone in your area, and that is countrywide. That is not just in our service area. And so we want to make you have, have note of that, especially for those that may be hit with disaster or crisis on their farm. I'm going to check to see if we have any any other questions that showed up. Mm, not, no, we don't. We have some comments about uh, where farmers are coming from today. So we have Virginia, we have Puerto Rico, uh, Detroit. Uh, yes, if you you have any other questions, comments, we would love to hear you out. We, uh, have, we have one more, Carolina, and it, um, Margaret, it's around the market bill you mentioned earlier. Are market bills only introduced by the Senate? Uh, no, they are introduced in both houses. Um, I just haven't heard a deadline for the House is why I didn't name one. Um, but typically, um, and you'll see this reflected when our market bill tracker goes live. Ideally, when you introduce a marker bill <laughs> for the best success you want, a Republican and a Democrat on it as a co-sponsor, and you want that for both chambers of the House. Um, but you can still introduce a marker bill even, you know, if you're a senator and you don't have a corresponding House co-sponsor, you can still introduce a marker bill and vice versa. Um, it just has the best chances if it gets introduced in both chambers, um, because then there's advocates for it in both chambers. Um, but I don't have a timeline on House marker bill introduction uh, that I have heard. Um, We've we've gotten more information from the Senate Ag Committee. Great. We still have a few more minutes. If you have any more questions, uh, please put them in the chat. But we also put an evaluation form uh, in the chat that we would love for you to go and fill out. It's again very short; shouldn't take you long. And uh, and then also remember earlier we gave you the link to uh, to another survey to really to give us a deeper dive on some of the issues that you all want us to talk about. Uh, as we develop this series and kind of continue this online uh, training and, and presentations. Any final words, Margaret? Um, just thanks for coming out tonight. Um, and uh, yes, please get in touch uh, if if you're like super excited about this, want to learn more, want to want to work with us, etc. Our work is uh, only here because of farmers and <laughs> uh, made possible by farmers, uh, informed by farmers. Um, and so, yeah, love to work with you. And um, yeah, hope you can join us for future trainings. Um, feel free to um, share this recording when it goes up with others, the more that we can get farmer voices heard. Um, 
on the Hill as the Farm Bill gets written, the better a bill we'll have. So thanks for coming. Yeah, I just echo that. I want to thank Carolina, our, our colleague, for handling all the tech and behind the scenes. Thank you to our interpreters and thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. And we're going to be able to give you nine minutes back of your time because we had planned an hour for this. So again, thank you. And please uh, fill out those surveys. And if not, uh, get in touch with us. Have a thank great you. night, y'all.